Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this um, second session of the 24 our 2024 REA meeting. I'm Wanda Stahl. I'm one of the program co-chairs for this um, meeting centered on Dear Earth. Um, and I have the privilege of um, facilitating this conversation on sacred conversations. We've got a couple of really wonderful papers that I hope you folks have had a chance to check out before uh, this session. Um, but if not, we are glad you're here and um, trust that you will glean some uh, wisdom from what you'll, what you'll hear. How we're gonna be structuring our time today is that um, Maureen will be presenting her paper first, followed by Ben and Leah. And then we'll offer them a little opportunity to respond to one another. Um, we'll take a moment um, after that, just to give you all a chance to let your thoughts collect. Um, and then we'll open it for general discussion um, with all the meeting participants. Um, just a few guidelines about our conversation. Um, we just invite you to please be listening with a spirit of curiosity. Um, to practice generosity with one another and assume good intentions from folks' comments and questions. Um, and as much as possible to stick to the um, session and paper topics um, in, our, in your questions and responses. Before I introduce our speakers, I just invite us to take a minute to ground and center. So close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. Take a few deep breaths in and let them out. Place your feet on the floor if you are able to do so. And envision your rootedness in dear earth. May we carry this spirit of centering and grounding with us as we proceed through this session. <clears throat> so I'll introduce first, Maureen O'Brien. Maureen is Professor Emerita of D Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's a religious educator and practical theologian whose interests include lay ministry education, the pedagogy and theological charism of the Spiritan religious congregation, and religious education for addressing ecological issues. She's served REA in many capacities and will join the co-editorial team of the REA Horizon series in 2025. Ben Yashua Davis serves as Director of Applied Research for the BTS Center in Portland, Maine, where he shapes the organization's posture of rigorous and reverent curiosity focused on research that supports and shares the wisdom of on the ground practitioners working in a climate changed world. He's a graduate of Drew Theological Seminary and Colby College. Ben is a Maine native and currently lives on Shibig Island, Maine with his wife, Melissa, son, Michael and daughters, Genevieve and Emmeline, where he directs the community chorus and delivers ten, tins of cookies to unsuspecting neighbors. Almost wants you to make wants you to move out to the island so you can get some cookies. The Reverend Dr. Leah Shade is the Associate Professor of Preaching and Worship at Lexington Theological Seminary in Kentucky, an ordained Lutheran minister in the ELCA for more than 20 years. She's pastored congregations in suburban, urban, and rural context. Leah has written six books, including Creatious, Creation Crisis Preaching, Preaching in the Purple Zone, an introduction to preaching. Her forthcoming book, Preaching and Social Issues, will be published this fall. She's serving as president of the Academy of Homiletics in 2024 and is the director of two grant projects focusing on preaching and environmental issues. And with that, I will turn it over to Maureen to get us started. Thanks, Wanda. And thanks to Wanda and to Dory for putting this marvelous meeting together. Can everyone see the slides? Okay. All right. Um, 
So as you see, the uh, title and the focus of my paper is uh, Laudato Si and Ecological Conversion, um, particularly from a Catholic perspective. But I wanted to have us start with a, a moment of reflection to center on this topic of ecological conversion. And so here are some points for you to think about for a moment. So reflect on your own understanding and experience of any or all of the following. Conversion in your faith tradition. The role, if any, played by religious education in fostering faith, uh, fostering conversion in your faith tradition. And whether ecological conversion is a meaningful category for religious education in your faith tradition. So just take a moment with any of those that are meaningful for you. And if you want to write anything down for thinking about later, feel free to do that. Okay, so this is an attempt to give you an overview of the paper, and if you haven't read it, I hope you'll have a chance to do that later on. So within the paper, what I'm trying to get at is a thesis that includes the following, that ecological conversion is a category that is viably situated within Catholic social teaching and a theology of conversion, and that five key aspects of what Pope Francis calls ecological conversion can be drawn forth from those sources and from his uh, encyclical letter Laudato Si and the shorter document that followed called Laudate Deum and fostered through religious education. And so the paper outlines those uh, five aspects. And then looking at one particular curriculum called Homemakers, um, I see that as offering a rich source for imaginatively practicing religious education for ecological conversion. So I start the paper with a short overview of Catholic social teaching. And so this slide is an even shorter overview of the, that piece in the paper. So I'm not going to read through all of these principles, but just simply give you a chance to look at it. And it's a documentary tradition that dates from the end of the 19th century from popes and the uh, magisterium of the Catholic Church, the bishops, and, uh, uh, and a voluminous tradition. So just to just look through the key principles that are distilled from Catholic social teaching as those documents articulate it. With care for creation as the, the last one listed there and the, the, the last one to be uh, substantively articulated within that tradition. But then the category also, which is important for the the paper and for uh, ecological teaching as for the others to be explicitly articulated of structural or social sin, which uh, would say that sin, while understood as a personal category, uh, accumulates within the structures of society and perpetuates uh, injustice as well as 
increases the, the possibility of individual personal sin and is evident in conditions such as racism, sexism, economic injustice, and environmental degradation. Then the paper goes on to give again a, a kind of a short summary of Laudato Si, Pope Francis's uh, very significant encyclical letter of 2015, which was the first document in the Catholic social teaching tradition to do such a, a, a substantive articulation of the ecological crisis and uses what's called the See Judge Act method. So uh, short uh, summaries of the chapters, uh, which go from seeing the signs of the times in terms of the ecological crisis to moving to how do we judge, discern what, what are the realities theologically, scripture themes, the human roots of that crisis, notably in what the Pope calls the technocratic paradigm, and then what is the alternative paradigm to respond to that crisis, which he calls integral ecology, the sense that everything is connected, then acting, how do we act in the face of that pair uh, of, of the um, signs of the times? What are the recommendations for action? And uh, finally, turning to a spiritual and educational meditation and this sense of ecological conversion. Laudate Deum, a much shorter piece with a great sense of urgency that was timed in 2023 to precede the, uh, the COP28 talks and that focused particularly on the climate crisis and was a call to world leaders in particular to um, uh, decrease and drastically reduce and move toward the elimination of fossil fuels and uh, uh, so it came out just really within the last year. And while it talked um, about the role of individuals and families and congregations in terms of the climate crisis, it also focused responsibility clearly and squarely on world leaders to um, assume responsibility at the COP talks to, um, to take action. So then uh, where I was trying to, to dig into the documents was to say, where can we look to really understand what this notion of ecological conversion is about and to see where it takes us in terms of religious education. So in the paper, I did this in separate sections for the sake of time today. I tried to put them together a bit more. So five key aspects of ecological conversion and how they're illustrated in this uh, curriculum called Homemakers. So Homemakers itself is a free curriculum that is a collaboration of Catholic Climate Covenant and the Marian Old Fathers and Brothers. It has versions for high school, college, and young adults, and I'm only dealing with the track for the young adults in parish groups. And anybody can access it at the link that's here and that's in the paper. So you just go, you put your name and your email address in, and they give you access to the curriculum. And it consists of, an, consists of instructor's guides and slide decks for the sessions. So the parish group uh, uh, curriculum is 10 sessions, which is also divided into three subtracks that could be used uh, separately from each other. So in doing this analysis, I took, uh, also found very, very helpful Patrick Manning's book, which is from the Horizon series of Religious Education Association, his book called Converting the Imagination, in which he talks about what he calls the C uh, process uh, for converting the imagination, uh, stimulating, expanding, and embracing the imagination, as well as the work of uh, ecological ethicist Erin Lothes Bibiano. And she did a study that I think uh, my, my co-presenters would find very helpful, where she, a, a book called Inspired Sustainability, where she looked at e uh, uh, ecological activists uh, who work in congregations and how they uh, identified both what helps in those congregations uh, to inspire ecological activism and what she called the gaps 
uh, what were the gaps that, that created obstacles for such activism. So the book is, is available, but also the, uh, an article that she distilled uh, those, the results called Inspiring the Ecological Mission of the American Catholic Church. So the five key aspects, and then where I saw some uh, illustrations in homemakers is, is what follows in this presentation. So uh, Pope Francis and um, ecological conversion drawing from a theology of conversion. First, a sense that I think would be pretty common to uh, those in the Christian tradition, the sense of radical personal change. It, it, it's integral to uh, uh, conversion, a sense of metanoia, turning from sin to a new way of life. Assumed here is that this is an ongoing process. And I think the quote here in Laudato C si is helpful for illustrating how this takes a particular ecological turn. So uh, Pope Francis took his name when he became Pope from St. Francis of Assisi. And so uh, the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi uh, suffuses this document in calling this figure to mind. We come to realize that a healthy relationship with creation is one dimension of overall personal conversion, entailing the recognition of our errors, sins, faults, and failures, leads to heartfelt repentance and desire to change. And so uh, in both uh, Laudato Si and Laudate Deum, this is a conversion from, there's always in conversion, it's from to something else. Here it's from the technocratic paradigm, which is about domination and possessiveness, uh, taking over something, in this case, the goods of the earth for one's own gain, taking that over. But then the conversion is to integral ecology, the sense that we are one with the earth, we are one with the sacred creation, we, everything is connected. So that's the, the nub of, of this conversion. In homemakers, one of the ways that this becomes quite evident is, for example, in the closing ritual of the first session of these 10 sessions. So there's a threshold ritual. It's quite beautiful where everyone brings a sacred object like we did this morning for uh, the, the opening session, but that as uh, the, there's a sense of crossing a threshold and the participants are encouraged to remember their baptism and remember their confirmation when they crossed a sort of threshold, uh, these, these um, liminal uh, experiences. So as we embark upon our homemaker's journey together, we cross a threshold toward becoming protagonists of transformation in bringing about God's dream for creation. Uh, protagonist is a very important term for Pope Francis. So we mark these threshold moments in our faith tradition. So too, we mark this threshold moment of the beginning of our journey together with elements of creation. Second aspect uh, here, I brought uh, out the sense of theological anthropology. What is it in uh, this tradition to be a human person in relationship? So uh, the nature of the human person is always in relationship. In Laudato Si, this is distilled into three key relationships with God, with other people, and with nature, with creation. And so all human persons possess freedom and dignity, but these have been disrupted, negatively affected by sin, both personal sin and social sin. And so uh, through God's grace, and through the choice, through freedom, um, to be um, brought back into harmony of interconnectedness. This, is, uh, this happens through openness to uh, ecological conversion. Uh, I thought that this was a, an interesting example in homemakers uh, in, in a session where they focus on the history of indigenous communities in the United States. And the presumption here in this, in this session is that the participants don't know a great deal about the background of indigenous communities. And so they've been given some homework to do in the previous session to research a little bit about indigenous communities and to bring the results of the homework to this session three. 
And so they have a chance to share that. So what I've done here in the slideshow is I've just put three of the uh, slides from the slide deck of whole makers into this session. And I, I'm very struck by how they attempt to do, it seems, a theological anthropology that highlights freedom and dignity for the indigenous communities of the U.S. and to do it in a way that um, emphasizes freedom and dignity, also exploitation and colonization, but the resilience of the indigenous people and their uh, their historical commitment to the land and to uh, reverence for nature. So you won't read everything on these slides, but I highlighted a few aspects. So participants, why do you think it might be important to focus on the experience of indigenous communities in terms of thinking about ecological spirituality and climate action? So they are invited into reflection. Then some information, why does this matter? Again, I highlighted a few points out of many. That last bullet point, we have to do this carefully so that we don't replicate colonization. And we have to note vulnerability in contemporary times and how this is part of a history of vulnerability, of colonization, of injustice. But final point, resilience, resistance, creativity, not just tragedy. So the dignity of indigenous people in this kind of dialectical engagement is highlighted. Third aspect of ecological conversion, um, this is very much part of a theology of conversion in a Catholic mode, is it's multifaceted. And Bernard Lonergan has been uh, the, the theologian constantly cited to, un to unpack this, 20th century Catholic Jesuit theologian, talked about religious, moral, and intellectual aspects of, of conversion. And then Robert Doran, also a Jesuit uh, theologian, added a psychic or aesthetic dimension. So these are, are talked about in the paper, but they all involve aspects of moving again from a particular disposition to a different disposition. And so uh, a paper, a key, a key journal article by um, Ormerod and Bannon translates this uh, into ecological conversion. So each of these dimensions uh, has an ecological um, uh, flavor to it that can be drawn out from um, Pope Francis's writings. And I thought this was beautifully illustrated in Homemakers, I mean, at any, in any number of examples, but the one I chose in the paper to talk about was uh, a video where they use kenosis. So the self-emptying aspect of Christ uh, really draws this forward and uses the tradition, uh, the biblical tradition on Jesus self-emptying then to say, what does it mean for us to um, to think about what what are we willing to give ourselves up for? Where are we willing to sacrifice? Well, whom do we love? What do we love? Whom and what are we in relationship with? And Patrick Manning's work, again, I think is very helpful here because to stimulate and uh, expand the imaginations of participants to say, well, we love, people certainly we love those close to us but if we if we love nature if we are in relationship with the world that nurtures us and that we spend time in and that appreciate its beauty think of that aesthetic dimension uh, of conversion um, think of the religious aspect of conversion well this video just so beautifully ties together can uh, kenosis and says you know, where are we willing to self-surrender for the sake of the earth, uh, where are we willing to identify with Jesus in this self-emptying vision? 
Fourth, uh, the, the aspect of community. And so here I had two kind of subcategories. One was that um, the community, that the conversion is worked out in communities. And so their symbol systems matter in how we express the nature of our conversion. And so education is vital and formation is vital for that. But secondly, that community is, um, community conversion is, is uh, vital as well. It's not just about individual conversions. And again, I think um, my co-presenters will have a lot to say about this. And Holmakers uh, draws very effectively on the symbol and language systems of the Catholic faith community. I was, I just loved their use of these um, images of holy mentors. And this is um, Gracie Morbitzer is her name, the artist who, uh, who did the modern saints. And I apologize, I had uh, misspelled her name in the paper, but that's because my aging eyes misread the, uh, uh, the, the modern font that they used on the website. So make the correction if you're, if you're looking it up. Her, her name is Gracie Morbitzer, and she has a whole wonderful collection of these uh, iconic images updated of modern saints. So this was St. Ignatius for uh, ecological conversion in session two. And, uh, and then I also use Jane Regan to talk about um, community conversion. And then the fifth uh, aspect that I highlighted is that conversion is realized and, and fully expressed through action. And Lonergan would agree and say that uh, authenticity is the kind of final sign of conversion. And Laudato Si and Laudate Deum have spawned all uh, many, many different resources that have uh, pointed toward this educationally and through action responses uh, for individuals, for families, for congregations, uh, for, for different kinds of organizations. And uh, a number of them use this model of see, judge, and act. And so homemakers has done this uh, in their final three sessions. They, they move directly into uh, a kind of form, uh, formation process for advocacy and action. And so they basically are training units, those last three sessions where participants having uh, accompanied one another on this um, journey of, of, of conversion, they are invited to choose a focused action to plan and execute as an expression of their conversion uh, and that are invited to call themselves a community of ecological protagonists. So then I close just with the uh, short reflections that I think do dovetail well with the second paper that, it, that it's important to have a variety of methods for this kind of work and I think that Homemakers does that and that I think religious educators have many skills to offer uh, congregations, certainly, in fostering communities of practice that would be important to help them to grow as protagonists uh, for ecological conversion and commitment. And again, uh, the second paper is explicit about this, uh, needing to form source, uh, be collaborators and form um, and create sources for spiritual sustenance to be able to keep ourselves going uh, in this journey. So thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I invite anyone to express their appreciation for me, Maureen's paper, either in the chat or by offering the um, some applause, either with your emojis or with your hands. And with that, I will turn it over to Ben and Leah. Thank you, Wanda. It is so good to be with you all. Uh, we're gonna be talking about what it looks like to teach ecological engagement in congregations. And Maureen, I'll just say, I was noting all the profound through lines that we can draw from what you offer and what we're gonna be able to offer today. So this will be a co-presentation with myself, with my colleague, Leah Shade at Lexington Theological Seminary, Markeisha Scott, who teaches at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver and does research on congregations and the environment, also participated in writing our paper, but was unable to join us today. 
what we're going to do is review um, our research, which is which describes the challenges and strategies for teaching ecological engagement in congregations. Does this primarily through research based on studying the participants in the Eco Preacher cohort, which Leah will be introducing to you all in a moment, and leaders of Eco Preacher participant congregations to both understand the impact of Eco Preaching and the context in which it happens, and then draw on social movement theory to name challenges, explore pathways, and suggest pedagogical strategies for ecological engagement. Thanks, Ben. The Eco Preacher cohort began in November 2022 as a pilot program spawned by the BTS Center in conjunction with Creation Justice Ministries and Lexington Theological Seminary. We wanted to create space for preachers to come together online once a month to figure out how to address climate change in their context. So uh, with inspiring speakers and kinship groups, we uh, attempted to equip a company, network, and resource them for this task. We were hoping to get maybe 40 people signed up, and when we ended up with 100, we knew we were on to something. Um, so uh, we applied for a grant from the Lilly Endowment Incorporated, and received a 1.25 million grant for 2024 to 2029 titled Compelling Preaching for a Climate Changed World. So we're, uh, we're just at the, the cusp of launching the next cohort. And so this is very timely for us to share what we've learned so far and to hear some uh, suggestions and comments and observations from all of you. Next slide, please. One of the things that we wanted to do for this paper was to draw on social movement theory to help frame what we learned from our surveys, focus groups, and interviews, both with the Eco Preacher participants and with the congregational leaders who took before and after surveys. So just an overview of what we're drawing from here with social movement theory is that religion and environmental movements co-inform, co-shape, and co-influence each other. So we're using social movement theory to examine, well, what is the role of religion in the environmental movement, and how is the environmental movement affecting religious education, specifically the role of the preacher as educator using framing and rhetorical strategies. We um, draw uh, on Doug McAdams' work from Grievance, Moral Imperative, Resources, Political, and Sense of Viability. Those are the, the five aspects of social movements that he says need to be in place for them to gain traction and to have an effect over time. We also looked at Johnston and Klanerman's work and looked at the role of um, religion, both as a change inhibitor, you know, trying to preserve tradition, but also as change agent in the sense of articulating oppression, critiquing the power structures. For eco-theologians and for uh, religious environmental activists, we see them emphasizing religion as a change agent. So how can religion contribute to the social movement specifically with an environmental uh, emphasis, they can articulate grievances using scripture and religious teachings. They can frame moral imperatives by connecting core faith values to environmental issues. They can provide resources like a place to meet, funding, institutional support. They can also catalyze policy changes when they gather together to go to state legislatures and, and advocate for climate policies and adding moral and ethical dimensions. So the, the, the gathering of the people around rituals and symbols like baptism and communion helps to elevate the teaching and the movement. And, and so it finds both transcendence and imminence within their faith tradition. Next slide, please. So framing is really important for teaching ecological engagement in congregations. Um, drawing on Snow, 
we're using his definition of frames as those things that define some existing problem, annoyance or condition, as an injustice that demands correction or elimination rather than as a misfortune that warrants only charitable con consideration. So it moves from, oh, isn't that awful, to, oh my gosh, we need to do something about this. The function of the frame takes that energy from the grievance and converts it into compelling motivation for action. So I'm thinking about the, you know, what is conversion? Uh, what we heard in the previous presentation, we're thinking about those questions as well. Now, the problem with the environmental movement is that the grievances about environmental issues and climate change often are seen as so vague and large and overwhelming that they don't always gain traction. People don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond. So we're thinking about ways in which there can be collaboration between the environment movement and people of faith by leveraging religious values and ethics through preaching in particular. Next slide. So what is the role of preaching in meaning construction? Um, there, there's public discourse. So there, it's, it's an act of making a, a religious speech in the presence of a public congregation and now can be seen on the internet. Um, it is a form of persuasive communication and it, it functions in the role of consciousness raising during collective action. But there are different ways that rhetoric can be used in social movements. So one thing that we often see in the, um, the rhetoric of those who wanna push back against any kind of environmental work is a rhetoric of inaction. And those fall into three categories. That of jeopardy, like, well, if we make changes, it's gonna mess things up even worse. Or futility, it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't, you know, won't make a difference, we're not powerful enough, we're not big enough, that sort of thing. And then perverse effects. If we change things, we'll actually make things worse. Like, we can't work on the environment because that will delay the parousia, that will make Christ not come back in time. Um, so we see that in, in certain Christian circles. In contrast to that, we're looking at a rhetoric of change with urgency, agency, and possibility. So taking immediate action to prevent worsening conditions. Agency is um, seeing opportunities that we can seize right now to help make life better and to help Minim minimize the worst effects of climate change. And then possibility, um, using prophetic theological visioning to see that when we enact the better policies and there's greater justice, we uh, make for uh, the, the building of the, the realm of God. Next slide. So when we see sermons that raise awareness about climate related disasters and the moral obligation of the church, that's an example of urgency. When we see pastors encouraging people to participate in climate marches or advocacy days or environmental cleanup, that's an aspect of agency. When we see them using language that deepens their connection with God through nature, through like hikes and prayer and meditation or um, studies on creation care, those are part of possibility. So we're testing these themes now going forward with this five-year grant to see how, in what ways are they effective to create that conversion experience um, and, and what role sermons play in that. So our research used the mixed methods methodology. So this is where, um, this is where we got our data from. First of all, we did entrance surveys and exit surveys with eco-preacher participants. So these are people who participated in the eco-preacher cohort, most of whom were active preachers in a local, generally mainline Christian congregation. The second is that we did entrance and exit surveys with leaders in the participants' congregation. So in addition to surveying leaders, we also asked them to send out another survey that was sent out to people in their congregations so we could get their same perspective often on similar questions. Finally, we did a set of focus groups with eco-preacher participants at the beginning, middle, and end of the cohort, focusing on evaluating eco-preacher's impact on ecological engagement in churches and on better understanding participant contexts. 
So what did we discover? And I'll say, um, as we do this, you're going to notice all the themes that Leah talked about begin to um, begin to emerge. One of the first things we noted uh, right in our entrance surveys was the obstacles that people were naming to ecological engagement. In our entrance survey, we asked, in your assessment, what are the major reasons some in the congregation are willing to be engaged in environment slash climate advocacy or activism? And what are the major reasons why others are unwilling? And that final question was very revealing. When we asked eco-preacher participants about this question, they said the most likely reason that congreg congregations were unwilling was conflict caused by political difference. This probably does not sound unfamiliar to many of us. We're afraid to say the word climate in the pulpit or maybe in the classroom because we're afraid someone might walk out, withdraw their pledge, or otherwise cause a scene. However, when we asked the same question to leaders in the congregation, they gave a different response. They said the primary reason why congregants would be unwilling was old age or lack of time, energy, and resources. We likewise saw a contrast when we looked at the second most likely reason why each group named that their congregation would be unwilling. And for eco preacher participants, they said the second most likely reason is apathy. And there was a lot of morally charged language that they used to describe this apathy. You could just hear the frustration coming off the coming out of the survey. They talked about congregations being complacent, apathetic, blind, or closed-minded. Now, congregational leaders also said that lack of urgency was an issue. But what they described was that the issue was they simply didn't know what to do. They felt overwhelmed. They didn't know where to begin. And this pointed out to us two very important things as we began our research. The first is that there was a significant defect between preachers and members of their congregation and how they understood the obstacles to ecological engagement. And these made a difference because how we approach um, Talking to a group of people about climate, for instance, when our primary concern is mitigating fear of conflict, might be very different than a group of people who are feeling overwhelmed or exhausted. The second thing this pointed out is that you cannot disembed questions of ecological engagement from congregational life. In other words, what is happening in the life of the community uh, really, really matters. This came home to us in a focus group where we were asking about congregational engagement with environment and climate. And the person said, I want to bring them on board and give them a reason to care for creation more. But I'm also stuck with how to get people just excited about being here. We've got 30 people, maybe on a Sunday morning in a space designed for 200 to 250 people. And I can't even get them to sit close to each other. You know, they show up at the last minute and they walk out as soon as I say, go in peace, serve the Lord. The context of what was happening in that congregation, their unwillingness to almost spend any time in the same room together, deeply inhibited their ability to deal with any question beyond themselves, let alone questions of ecological import. From here, we noticed that participants very quickly began to name, however, the pathways into ecological engagement in their settings. The first one that they named was about fostering connection with place. They noticed that asking questions like, what do you love about this place? Or how do you see this place changing? Were powerful questions that led to ecological engagement. So for instance, one person who is a preacher in a conservative area of the country said, we can argue all day about what causes what or what policies need to be in place. But the reality is that that's happening. In other words, climate is still happening. Environmental change is still happening and they can see it. And so we can just have that kind of conversation. Sometimes starting with place allowed preachers to bypass political polarization and have concrete conversations about what was going on in their community. The second pathway that was named was to teach within the idiom of their own religious tradition, particularly through sacred text. Participants noticed how teaching through scriptural frameworks bypassed political polarization. So in other words, saying, this is important because the scientists told us so, or certain politicians said us so, would elicit a very different reaction than saying, actually, for instance, in a Christian context, the Bible tells us so, because it allowed people to enter into a different framework from which to make decisions. They also noticed that the understanding that scripture could be inherently ecological also opened up new possibilities. 
such as the um, the imperative to be a good neighbor. And when they began to expand the concept of who our neighbors are to include non-humans, it became not only how am I treating my neighbor as myself, being the human who lives next door to me or down the street or in the next community, but how am I treating my neighbor who happens to be a river or a tree or an insect? The third pathway that they named um, was personal encounter with the natural world. Many of them shared that their, quote, ecological conversion, and this was language that they used quite frequently, happened in encounter with the more than human world of which they were a part. They would talk about growing up hunting or fishing. They would talk about their practice of gathering. They would talk, or talk about attending church camps outdoor, and that being the place where they received a felt call from the divine to integrate, integrate, ecology, um, integrate ecology into their work. They also notice somehow at times that simply meeting outdoors, just meeting outdoors, naturally increased their congregation's willingness to engage with environmental issues, even if they never talked about them. There was one congregation that talked about how one of the great gifts of COVID was they had to worship outdoors under the branches of a 350-year-old oak tree that was in front of their sanctuary and what that oak tree taught them as a part of, uh, as a part of shaping their own ministry. The fourth pathway that they named was to connect other justice concerns with the environment through an intersectional lens. So when preachers were able to demonstrate how the environment was woven into the fabric of other forms of justice seeking, it reframed care for the earth as part of all justice seeking and allowed congregations to, apply, to prioritize with greater clarity. So rather than, for instance, positing that care for the environment was one issue in kind of a Darwinian marketplace of social justice issues where you had to choose one or the other, but you couldn't choose them all, talking about, for instance, the ways that climate change and environmental degradation disproportionately impacts historically marginalized communities, such as communities of color, helped people understand how their passion for racial justice also had something to do with ecological justice. Talking about environmental degradation in the global south and climate migration became a way to see intersections between, between the environment and climate and welcoming immigrant kin who were on the borders. All of this allowed people, in the words of one pr preacher, said, my congregation, this choir, she called her congregation, this choir is well-intentioned, but needs to learn how to sing together. And by making these connections, it allowed our congregation to weave their priorities into one whole vision. We also noticed that there were some strategies that emerged. Actually, before I talk about the strategies, I also want to point out that context really impacted the effectiveness of each pathway. You would not deploy these pathways in the same order of priority or in the same way dependent on watershed, um, oftentimes dependent on race or socioeconomic status or even the neighborhood that you lived in or um, depending on partisan identification in your congregation. So for instance, working in a, working in a white dominant conservative context, um, oftentimes beginning with place would work, connecting climate with other social justice concerns would probably be a non-starter. Conversely, working in a privileged progressive community with a lot of people who were transplants, you might not start with place, but beginning to connect environment with other felt issues of social concern was often highly effective. We also noticed that there were a couple strategies that emerged for engaging these pathways, for teaching ecological engagement. The first was to frame ecological engagement within the context of how participants understood the relationship between humanity and the rest of the natural world. This going back, in fact, in many ways to what Maureen was talking about is conversion being a part of how we understand our relations between one another. We noticed in particular a shift in our entrance and exit surveys with participants and how they understood um, their relation to the more than human world. The dominant understandings that have often been studied by groups such as PRRI and Pew are either dominion, so the idea that God gave humans the right to use the earth, including the plants and animals for humanity's benefit, versus stewardship, the idea that God gave humans a duty to protect and care for the earth, including the plants and animals. Both of these presuppose, though, the same power hierarchy. Now, both of them, it's like, are you going to be a good ruler or a bad ruler? What emerged by the exit surveys was kinship. So this understanding that God calls humans to protect, practice cooperative, non-hierarchical relationships with the earth, 
including the plants and animals. And this led to people relating to place differently, having different encounters with the more than human world, reading scripture differently, and understanding what it meant to practice justice for their neighbors, those who were human and those who were other than human. They also noted how important it was to offer theological framing to discover, to describe what was already happening in their communities where they were located. We in particular noticed the shift among congregational leaders and the entrance and exit surveys, where in intake surveys, climate was described in globalized abstracts. We have to fight, quote, global temperature change was one of the responses, and where they were looking for resources around individual consumption changes. I hope my pastor will teach us how to reduce plastic water bottle usage um, in our congregation. What changed by the exit surveys is that congregational leaders began to describe climate in terms of concrete impacts in local communities. They described sea level rise, they described changing ecologies, they described extreme weather events, and they were also looking for something different. They were looking for theological resources for practicing adaptation, fostering resilience, and also connecting to theologies like hope. What does it mean to live hopefully when we're no longer sure that everything's gonna turn out okay in the end? We have a lot of questions that we want to offer back to you as practitioners about the ways that you see context affecting how you're teaching in your settings, what pathways for ecological engagement you're using, and how you've used some of these pedagogical strategies and what others you might name. And we're looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. Thank you, Ben and Leah. I invite um, everyone to uh, express appreciation for what Ben and Leah have shared with us, either by um, using the American Sign Language sign for applause or using your emoji. And now I invite um, some conversation between Ben and Leah and Maureen, if there's um, questions, responses, um, comments that you'd like to offer one another as you um, look at some of the connecting points and maybe points of um, tension between both of your papers as you presented them. Leah? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Maureen, for um, a really thoughtful paper I, I'm really curious when you were talking about metanoia as an ongoing process, that that is in contrast with the way that many people think about conversion as a once and done thing. And I wonder if you can just say a little bit more about how do we know when the conversion is happening, has happened, what, you know, I mean, we know it's never finished, but what are some things that would indicate that that this conversion, this metanoia um, is, is, is happening with people who are being educated about this? Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a, I think it's a distinctively Catholic way of understanding well maybe not only catholic but it is distinctively catholic to to understand conversion i think in an on as an ongoing process and i think it comes in at least in part out of a, out of the the vision of the catechumenate uh, which which it is is about a, a stage by stage journey with moments of, of along the journey and so, so to the extent we can know that conversion is happening, it's authenticated within community and with, with like I was saying about the, uh, that homemaker's ritual of the thresholds. For Catholics, there's always that emphasis on the sacraments. And so there are threshold moments that involve sacraments. But I think within this sense of the ongoing conversion, it's not always going to be formal sacraments, but I think you can extrapolate from that to say that looking for, for ongoing kind of authentications within community would be one way of validating it. 
So, so I think I would say that, that we probably, as a community, have to keep discovering together how we, how we authenticate conversion beyond the, the strictly sacramental moments. But that would be the beginning of my response, if that makes some sense. I, I love that. I love the idea of an, an, maybe an eco Um and that, um, you know, what are the stepping stones that we recognize in community with each other? I, I don't think we do that right now. I don't think we do that sort of thing. And what would it look like if we did? I, that, that really sparks some creative ideas for me. So thank you for that. And, and maybe just to tag onto that just very quickly, the, the again, like uh, things like renewal of baptismal promises, which happens in the Catholic community every, every, well, it happens every time you say the creed, but there are also sort of formal moments where you explicitly renew baptismal promises. What might that look like in an eco context as well? Yeah. Uh, let me ask uh, for you folks. I, I guess I, I would I would be interested in whether you saw a resonance between what I talked about in the paper from Aaron Lothes Viviano's work on the uh, sustainability activist, and I talked about those gaps she identified in her work with congregation. She talked about uh, the the activists saw no, uh, gaps of knowledge, empathy, and action. And it seemed to me that those were, were a helpful sort of resonance with your, uh, you were talking about the rhetorics of, the rhetorics of inaction, like the jeopardy, futility, and uh, um, the third one, perverse effects, I guess. But, uh, but I, I was struck by the, the, the gaps of knowledge, gaps of empathy, gap, uh, which would be caring. You know? So gap of knowledge would be either either willful blindness or just not knowing. Uh, the gap of empathy would be, it, it could be apathy, I suppose, but the, the sense of, uh, it could be overwhelmed too, you know, um, either I, I just don't want to care or I'm just too, I'm just too overburdened, I'm burned out. And then the action gap, well, I care, but I'm not going to do anything or I just don't care enough. Did, did that language resonate for you as, as you looked at her work or looked at my summary of her work? Go ahead, Ben, and then I'll weigh in. Yes, and I actually found the reference to that book really, really helpful. I was reflecting on the ways that these appeared both with congregational leaders and with eco-preacher participants though to different extents and in different ways for both of them. And that was part of our, our survey results as we talked about kind of the disconnect between how preachers understood what was happening in their congregations and leaders understood what was happening in their congregations. I was noting with many of our eco-preacher participants, knowledge and empathy were oftentimes not the problems. Action was, um, action was often a significant problem where there was oftentimes for preachers this sense of paralysis about oh my goodness, what can I do about it? This feels so huge, and I feel so small, and what are what are next steps? How can I find companions along the way? I got the impression that, that um, in congregations, the context varied much more significantly, but with participants, we often found that action was the place where they were really looking for help and support. Yeah, and I'll add that I think one thing that maybe we didn't touch on enough and well we didn't but but it, it, this is a huge aspect we didn't touch on it in this paper but it definitely came up in our sessions is the the level of climate anxiety and eco grief that Ooh. people are feeling right now and so when i think about the the empathy um aspect that you mentioned maureen um grieving the loss of um an indigenous tribe or um, a forest that one has grown up with um, or, you know, lightning, there's just not as many lightning bugs anymore. Once people start reflecting on this and it, it create, I mean, people know, even if they're in denial to a certain extent, I mean, you know, sort of the Kubler-Ross uh, categories, there is definitely a sense of, we know something is wrong 
we are deeply grieved by it. We might not be able to articulate it and we might need to, we might be in the stage of denial or anger um, and coming to accept it. What does that mean? Um, what, what does it, does that mean we just give up? Does, is it too late? What difference does it make? It's, it is, it is the existential crisis of our time. And I think it's very important where, you know, for, for preachers, for congregation leaders to find ways to create community, to create holding spaces for that grief in order to eventually move into whatever action flows organically out of that. Yeah, and I, I, I'm really looking forward to turning this to the whole group, but I'll just um, add there, it's both a question and a comment, but it's about preaching because as a Catholic, Catholics have a three-year lectionary. And so readings come up week by week by week in an entirely predictable way. And so to talk about preaching there is to talk about using those scriptures. And so, you know, I'm eager to hear how, um, how you all are looking at strategies for preaching, uh, lectionary-based or non-lectionary-based, because it could take different, uh, obviously different kinds of approaches depending on, on whether the degree to which scripture texts are, are chosen or not chosen. But I think that the word that is preached is going to make uh, a difference, even as we saw this morning in the um, in the workshop uh, with the the psalms, where we were invited to to choose particular psalms. You know, is it a psalm of lamentation? Is it a psalm of thanksgiving? Is it a psalm of, of uh, praise or adoration? Or of, uh, so uh, so that uh, that go, uh, to my point in in looking at conversion when we have a conversion experience uh, that fourth one about the community. So c conversion is worked out in the language of the community, but it matters which symbols we use. It matters which traditions we draw on. It matters do we talk about comforting the community versus calling the community to prophetic action. So, yeah, that, that those are great points, and it's one of the things that we're definitely going to be addressing in this first stage of the grant. We actually have our um, newly appointed homiletician in residence in the room with us, Carolyn Sharp. And we are looking, we're going to be creating sermon coaching groups where we're specifically helping preachers to workshop particular sermons and thinking about, well, how do you choose your check text or which, which, which lectionary are you going to use? Are you going to do it by theme? Um, and then what are some of the principles that you want to adhere to? And what are some of the rhetorical strategies? So I don't know, Carolyn, if you want to jump in and say a word about that. I would love to. And thanks to all of you presenters have done just a beautiful and generative job um, sparking our imagination. So um, I love the lectionary based question. As an Episcopal priest, I too function with a three year lectionary. And as one who teaches eco preaching, and I know Leah would agree with this too. Oh, give me any text in all of scripture and I will steep myself in it prayerfully and look at theology and ethics and I will be able to preach something as you could too also. Maureen, on um, a way of cherishing the living community of earth that God so loves on, you know, incarnational theology, prophetic vision. There is no line of scripture that would not invite under the superintendents of the Holy Spirit um, an eco sermon. So I do just want to honor both the, the point um, made about lamenting what is being lost, cherish what is being lost, cherish what has already died and is never coming back. That is so important pastorally in congregations and other, other communities of conviction too. And then kinship, which Ben had highlighted as a feature of the Eco Preacher program, which I went through as a participant last year. Kinship across human communities and lines of difference for sure, across species lines of difference, which Ben already articulated so beautifully. And then on into even you know, your your river, your biome, the soil, kinship with everything that God has made. There's so many beautiful ways to do this, especially once we get out of a framework of this must sound political and we have to harangue people about stopping their deleterious behaviors. Um, it's, it's just a joy to think about. So I really appreciate the question. 
thank you all um, for engaging so well with one another. And folks may have noticed in the chat um, some resources that Deborah and Ben and Leah have posted um, for uh, preaching um, with the lectionary. Um, I'm going to invite us just to take a minute for everyone just to, to um, be quiet and let's settle what has, what has been shared for the last hour or so. And in a minute, I will open it up um, for wider conversation amongst the rest of the participants. But let's just take a minute to let it settle and see what, what percolates. Does anyone have a comment or question or reflection um, that you'd like to offer? You can either, uh, Norma. Turn on my mic here. Uh, I'm a Lutheran ELCA professor and, and ordained clergy. And through the years, we've worked a lot on uh, the minister of the whole people of God. In other words, uh, people don't start being who they are once they leave the pew. They go out all week long and engage in many, many different things. And yet we all are part of this issue. We all live on this earth and we all uh, are local and global at the same time. And so uh, I think sometimes people are afraid to really know what other people are doing all week. Perhaps we have someone um, and there are different ways that they might be engaged in this in this issue uh, that may even seem to differ from each other. For example, a farmer or a lawyer or a mechanic or a librarian. Um, and each of them has a calling all week long. A librarian working with books and making resources available and, and so on. And Sometimes people say, well, no, it's just we're all together when we're, you know, in the sanctuary together. But learning from each other and even learning deep enough to know that we might go about um, our work as stewards of the earth in different ways that some may even think are contradictory, you know, uh, but that we come back, uh, we come back the next week and bring that with us and then we go forth again. So we are one, even though we are working with these issues in perhaps different ways. Thank you, Norma. Cheryl. Thank you um, to all of you for just such wonderful, deep work um, to, to chew on, so I'm still chewing. Um, I'm just going to ask one question, although there are many that I have, and that will be to Maureen. Um, on your eighth page of your paper, I've been sitting with it for quite a while, and I'm really curious um, if you could give me some more information about the converting the Im imagination. Um, and I'm really curious because it's uh, part of my, my field of work, but the pre-conscious um, and the change um, in, in the imagination. So going from pre-critical to critical and then from critical to post-critical. Um, what are the thoughts that Manning has shared or your insights about how that happens. And I ask that because usually as children, uh, and we tend to, to lose it a bit as we get older, but hopefully not very much, our imaginations are just wellsprings for encounters with the divine. And I, I'm curious about work that has been done about that. Well, I would 
very much defer to Pat Manning uh, to, to answer for the, uh, the um, substance and depth of his own work on that. But, but what he's doing in the book is he is drawing on um, developmental uh, the theorists in, in uh, using those categories. And he's also drawing on Paul Ricoeur's understanding of uh, first naivete and moving into kind okay. of critical the critical consciousness and then second naivete. So uh, so what he's saying is is uh, in his work with undergraduate students, he meets uh, young people who come, some of them uh, with, with the kind of pre-critical, many of them with the critical, but what he sees in, in these young people often at the critical stage is that they've, they've kind of moved out of seeing uh, uh, religion or faith as being very relevant to their lives, and he describes it as a sort of flattened imagination. Okay. So, uh, so any imaginative engagement with with their faith tradition, if they have one, has sort of gone away. And so, so they may have you know critical capacities, but in uh, the move to the post-critical is a re-engaging of imagination for them. Okay. Okay. So that's okay. in, that's in a nutshell. So it's you know stimulating and then being able to to move to um, a, a, an acknowledgement that there's an importance. He also just again since I'm doing a very quick uh, rendering of his his uh, engagement, it's uh, it's like uh, Jesus with the parables. So to stimulate the imagination would be it would it would follow a, a parabolic structure. So okay. I hope I Thank hope that you. helps. Yeah, but that is Reed helpful. Yeah. No. Okay, I will. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, he also you... uses oh, he sorry. also uses Lonergan uh, extensively. By the way, Bernard Lonergan's work on conversion. Sorry, it's uh, Patrick Manning's uh, converting the imagination. Yeah. Elizabeth and then Sophie. Hello, folks. Thank you very much for both papers. They were really very interesting. I'm uh, conscious uh, I'm a Uniting Church Minister uh, here in Australia, in Queensland. Um, and one of the things our, our church uh, in the uh, 2015 through to 2020 uh, was particularly interested in the caring for creation uh, and so a lot of energy there. Uh, but since COVID, the uh, the political issues and the health issues, we're now in another phase of COVID and a whooping cough and RSV, uh, really interesting, as, as well as a whole lot of uh, political stuff about um, Indigenous people. And it was great to see the connections uh, for Indigenous people with both of those. Uh, I'm just wondering, in the United States, North American uh, context, as well as around the world, um, has the the concern for uh, eco justice and uh, concern for preaching in this area been affected by um, the coronavirus uh, disruption? I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, in addition to working with um, the green zone, I also write about uh, the purple zone and I've studied uh, clergy and congregations around uh, ministry pre preaching and uh, political issues for the past seven years. And in our surveys, we have noted that, and, and, and that other researchers have can corroborate this, that most congregations are a shadow of what they were before COVID. And um, the, 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 those who left um, are, are not finding their way back. And it's very difficult. It's a lot of congregations are finding it difficult to re-engage young people, families with young people, um, members who have trouble because of health issues or mobility issues coming back and actually really appreciate the you know zoom or the live streaming but it's difficult to create community 
in, in a hybrid format and without being in person with the incarnational touch. And so I think we're still finding our way with that. I do think uh, one of the things that Ben mentioned in, in our presentation that there are ways to bring people together outside and connect again with place around the places that they already love and to see the congregation as expansive and inclusive of the the of the more than human world and to experiment with with those ways of gathering in community gathering for worship and being sent out to to live out our faith I'd love to see that go in that direction, and I'm hoping we can study that as part of our grant. Look, I'll add two things for this. First of all, we definitely, COVID came up a lot in our research, a lot in the entrance surveys, a lot in the focus groups. It was a huge um, sea change uh, for congregational life, getting back to this idea that ecological engagement happens within the context of congregational life. And so I think some of that exhaustion and overwhelm was like, oh goodness, not another thing that we're tired and now we feel guilty that we don't have enough energy to do. How are we going to deal with this? And so framing becomes really important and figuring out how does ecological engagement um, become not another worthwhile, exhausting mission project, but how can be it be integrated into what people are already doing? Even if it's as simple as we have our administrative council meetings outside, that is a meaningful form of ecological engagement. The other thing that comes up, um, and this was not in the scope of our paper, but has been in the scope of our research, is saying, so what happens when we allow um, the more than human world to teach us about what it means to be the church? Sometimes it offers us pathways back to sustainability. So for instance, nature operates in seasons. We're not always busy, 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 busy all the time in the way that modern white privileged um, Western life has taught us. And so sometimes another way to be ecologically engaged is to say, huh, what would the trees say about our exhaustion and the current pace of our church life? And sometimes, at least in my experience, they have good things to teach us. And so that's another way to invite ecological engagement into our context without adding on a yet another project to already exhausted people. Sophie? Yes, thanks to all of you for the presentation. And um, I actually wanted to pick up a bit on that sense of overwhelm. And um, I'm also, so I'm a PhD student but I also am working on a compelling preaching grant and a cohort model around preaching justice. So I'm just very, very compelled um, by the research that you have offered us today. You mentioned that there were different approaches needed in different contexts, whether people focused on watershed or the intersection with racial and social issues. How did your program help facilitate the preacher's ability to narrow in on what was going to make the most sense for their congregation or context? Like climate crisis is so big. How did you help facilitate that sense of focus and um, directing them when it can feel really overwhelming around what part of ecological you know, conversion do I start to engage with? That's a great question, Sophie, and congratulations on your grant. That's really wonderful. Um, one of the things that we did was, through, one of the ways we did that was through our kinship groups. So um, we did create groups according to what we, what we would call watershed, but really geographically, so that the things that the people in this region were facing in terms of, you know, um, climate-related disasters or, you know, just the features of their um, geography, they, they knew what they didn't they didn't have to spend a lot of time getting each other up to speed they already knew and so they could give each other support in that so the format of the eco preacher times would be um, the beginning would be uh, a presentation by a, a either a homiletician or a religious environmental activist or somebody who could give them ideas then they would go into their uh, kinship groups and think about how do I apply this in my context and, and have significant time to, to, to work on that and then come back out and, and have time for um, you know, large group sharing. So what we would like to do is to fine tune that in our 
in this next round where it's not necessarily according to watershed, but it might be, well, my congregation is in an urban area and I want to talk with other pastors who are in urban areas or my congregation is dealing with wildfires. I want to talk with other pastors who are dealing with wildfires. So we're giving them an opportunity to pick what things would be very helpful for them to talk with others about, and then we'll group them um, by those affinities, so to speak, for their kinship groups. Other comments or questions? Well, I had one. Um, Maureen was highlighting the importance of that nurturing and fostering of imagination that emerged in, um, in her research. And I was wondering, it didn't come up explicitly in the, um, in the paper, but I'm wondering where, if at all, that importance of nurturing imagination emerged um, in the eco-preacher cohort. Lee, do you want to go first or should I? You, you go ahead. Okay. So this is something that is very important to us at the BTS Center. The first uh, three words of our mission statement are to catalyze spiritual imagination. And we often think about this in terms of perception as imagination by the act that we expand. We have to talk about expanding our aperture to see possibilities that weren't available to us um, previously. And part of that is by learning to ask um, different questions. So in fact, Part of, for instance, what I was talking about in shift of worldview from uh, either either you believe in dominion or you believe in stewardship, sometimes the act of expanding imagination is just about learning to ask some really good generative questions. Like, are those the only options that are available to us as people who want to be good, uh, faithful people of faith in the current context we're in? And then hardly without us having to say a word at all, people went, huh, what about something that was non-hierarchical? And it just emerged. So I think uh, a lot of part of this is embedded in our pedagogical strategies and this belief that if we can ask the right questions and offer possibilities, that imagination naturally begins to expand and open up new possibilities in ways that are energizing and exciting. And I would add that um, there are scriptural resources that are underutilized right now for this. So to to think, I mean, if you really think about the ways in which scripture talks about the natural world as worshiping God, praising God, clapping hands, and, and realizing, okay, these are not, like there, there's a reason why nature is given um, agency, autonomy, um, and, and even bears witness. You know, there's, there are times in scripture where nature is called to bear witness against the sins of humanity that there's huge implications for that and it goes very much against the mechanistic um uh, newtonian view of the world and much more towards i would say even an indigenous view that that sees earth as kin as having a stake in what we do and what are the how does that impinge on us morally and and ethically and how how then shall we live so um so i'm really excited to for us as a in our grant to do more um to help people expand their theological imagination using scripture i'll just sorry go ahead marine just um, just to jump in quickly, uh, in my own experience in our congregation, I'm part of um, actively part of two different ministries, uh, and you all had mentioned the intersectional dimensions as uh, so effective in looking at in helping people who uh, who may not have ecology at top of their list, but when they started to see the intersectional dimensions with things they did care about, you know, it sparked them. Um, when you bring people together, uh, or when you when you bring people together from different ministries, that can spark imagination. So when they start to see, uh, by talking together, they start to see the connections uh, in a single congregation. That that's a really exciting experience that I've seen of the sparking of imaginations. It's like, oh, okay, we're on the, I'm, uh, the, the we have a Haiti committee, and we have a creation care team, and when the two started to interface and they saw 
the, it was a no-brainer of, gee, there are these profound um, uh, ecological disasters happening in Haiti and that we could uh, raise consciousness across the two different ministries uh, with, with no difficulties at all. The, the similarities and the convergences were so obvious. So. Well, thank you, everyone. This has really been just such a wonderful conversation. Um, I thank everyone for your contributions, either verbally, just in your very careful listening, or with the offerings that have been posted in the chat. As we're wrapping up our time here, um, Eric has just, uh, again, posted the link to the feedback survey in the chat. Please um, take a few minutes um, to complete that. Um, that information is very helpful to us, um, both as we continue this week and also as we look to future plannings. Um, and then just a few reminders. Um, our first plenary um, is coming up at five o'clock. Um, Deborah Reinstra is here in this room and she'll be facilitating that next, um, next session. And don't forget our welcoming reception at eight. Um, also, and please, um, um, Eric has also posted the link for the Padlet. Um, please look there for announcements and particularly about signing up for a walk and talk to get to know somebody new um, as we are to have a little bit more opportunity to be building community. Can I say one thing before you close, Wanda? Of course. I just started a Google Doc that is capturing these resources and I'm going to share that Google Doc with uh, edit ability for anyone. If there's a resource, just so they don't get lost in these chats, never to be seen again. So I'll share that in the Padlet. Thank you, Dory. And thank you, everyone. Um, blessings on the rest of your day. Hope we'll see you on a Zoom screen soon.